Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Life on the Wrist. Hope you all are doing well today. One of the things that I like to do is pay tribute to some of the watchmakers that have come before us and talk about the incredible place that they play, uh, an incredible place in history that they um, sort of take up in the hobby that we love, which is watchmaking. Um, I've covered a, a couple of watchmakers over the last couple of years who have made significant, uh, significant impact in... Um, a significant, a significant impact in the hobby that we love. And today I wanna to, um, talk about uh, Derek Pratt. Um, now, when you compare Derek Pratt to some of the other watchmakers that we've covered, the other watchmakers come from uh, many, many years ago. Derek Pratt might be the, more, um, the most recent watchmaker that we're gonna be covering. But I recently was listening to um, du the Dubai Watch Week uh, coverage from Revolution Watches and they had a panel where Max Boozer, the uh, founder of MBNF, was, uh, he was a part of the panel and he mentioned how significant Derek Pratt was in um, his decision to make his own company. And so I thought it was a good way. One, I'm super passionate about MBNF. I think Max is an incredible uh, person. <clears throat> and so um, I think it would be an incredible watchmaker to cover. Um, I also am um, a huge fan of independent watchmakers. I've been a fan for them um, for a very, very long time. They have gotten a lot more recognition now, and I think that's really exciting, and I don't think they would have uh, been able to do so without Derek Pratt, who really was, if you want to say it that way, kind of like the first, uh, or one of the, 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 the first people to really um, take on independent watchmaking. So without further ado, let's just uh, jump right into it. So Derek Pratt um, was born in Orpington, Kent, in the south of England in 1938, and um, it was noted that he was very, very into uh, mechanical objects as he grew up. Um, by the way, if I'm looking this way, it's because I'm reading the article that we've written. There will be an article on our website for this video as well if you want to read more about it. Um, he was educated at Beckham... At Beckham Beckenham uh, Technical School, where he met Derek Goldstein, um, where they started to um, uh, create uh, and design a thermostatic mixer, a mixer valve, which um, was uh, pretty significant. In 1956, he began learning watchmaking at the National College of Horology in London, where he did a three-year course as an apprentice of Smith & Sons. And when you go through these types of uh, schools, you obviously had to take a test to graduate. And what was pretty interesting is um, he decided to leave school before completing the exams, which is not something that you really would picture. You, you know, of course, you, you think, oh, a, an incredible watchmaker, they're probably going to finish um, their technical um, their technical uh, studies, but that uh, Derek Pratt did not did not uh, did not do that. Um, he eventually started um, sort of freelancing as a, as a watchmaker and then in 1965 um, he, uh, he, went, he ended up moving to Switzerland and that's where he started be, uh, restoring and um, developing chronometers and early iron clocks. And this is kind of where he ended up for most of his life. but. Um, this is sort of the beginning of where he began, became involved as a watchmaker. And throughout his freelancing career as a watchmaker and restorer, he ended up um, working on a lot of complex um, historical time pieces, and that's where he met Peter Baum, uh, Baumberger, um, who at the time was um, selling antique watches, but eventually ended up taking over Urban Jurgensen in 1979, which is uh, again where Pratt did a lot of his significant uh, work. So in 1979, Baumberger took over the company and Pratt became a consultant and technical director for the company. And that's where he really cut his teeth and made a lot of the incredible pieces um, that, uh, that were produced by this company. That's probably why if you look at Christie's and Phillips auctions, a lot of these Urban Jurgensen um, uh, watches uh, are um, a significant part of um, 
sort of the history of the brand, but also what a lot of companies, uh, what, of, what a lot of uh, collectors really love. He worked in some pretty historic pieces that have sold at, at auctions for, for, um, for uh, pretty incredible um, amounts. Probably one of the most famous um, things that uh, Pratt did was he worked on a pocket watch for Urban Jurgensen, which was a flying tourmillon Remontois Dante Escapement Power Reserve and Remur Scale. Um, this was an innovation that essentially wanted to challenge the way that traditional escapements were produced. By having a remontoir, you basically, um, one, reduce the, um, reduce the inaccuracies of, of the power going from the mainspring to the escapement, but it also allows for the watch to be less serviceable, so you don't have to use oils um, on the escapement to ensure that they're operating correctly. And so, um, you know, it, it, this was a step in the direction to try and produce a watch that's basically not, you know, you don't need to service. Now, of course, from a te technical, technical perspective, this is huge. This is a big movement forward for, for watchmaking, but you also have to admire the incredible um, beauty that this pocket watch has. And I think that is another demonstration of what Derek Pratt was able to contribute. Um, three of these watches were produced between 1987 and 1992. Each of them were about 4,000 hours of work, and so you can imagine these watches being um, incredibly, uh, incredibly significant in, in, in Derek Pratt's life, in Urban Jurgensen's life, and, and, um, um, and in watchmaking. What's really significant about these watches is they're actually oval in, in their K-shape. They're not completely round, which I think is quite interesting. They have a beautiful guilloche dial. Um, and uh, really plays the part of something that looks um, uh, looks incredibly uh, beautiful. Um, he used a lot of knowledge that came from a lot of the other watchmakers that we've discussed, Abraham Louis Breguet, John Arnold, and Professor Alfred Helvig. Um, and so th this is a, a, a big part of um, of sort of what he was able to contribute to, um, to to watchmaking. He was also very close with George Daniels, who is a watchmaker who reminisces about the time that he spent with with um, Derek Pratt. These are two significant individuals who eventually, um, you know, George Daniels goes on to for the coaxial escapement. There's a lot of crossover between these two uh, of where they came from, but also the significant. Um, progress that they've made um, with watchmaking. So Derek Pratt ended up living in Switzerland until 2009 where he ended up passing away. He was about an hour outside of uh, Zurich for the time that he did um, spend working on, on these watches and um, has, I think his, his contribution both um, comes both from like a independent watchmaking side but also to um, a technical side. So, obviously, this the concept of putting a tourbillon and a um, remontoir in one movement means more accurate, um, less wear, and overall a better, better designed watch. And I think combining all of those ideas is something that um, these were not obviously new creations that he came up with, but combining them was revolutionary for watchmaking from a technical perspective. But he also spent a ton of time um, being that freelancer, and almost be, and that is what an independent watchmaker really, really does. His contributions to Urban Jurgensen were also sort of a, a a way to to say, you know, he really partnered with this company to create these incredible pieces. And I think MBNF does something that has has a similar concept where they partner with independent watchmakers to say, help me produce something um, incredible here and that you know you can think of Stephen McDonald as an example um, so uh, significant from an independent watchmaking perspective significant from a technical perspective he brought together some some really key concepts that allowed him to produce something um, really unique uh, I think he's maybe not a watchmaker that some of you have heard of um, there's a lot of um, watchmakers that many of us haven't heard of, but 
similar to MBNF, I'm trying to bring to light the incredible watchmakers that have had an incredible contribution to, to the thing that we love. So thank you, Derek Pratt, for everything that you've done for, for watchmaking. Um, we're still enjoying it now and uh, we'll forever enjoy uh, the creations that you've been able to achieve. As you know, I was glancing down at my laptop. There will be an article on our website if you want to check out more about Derek Pratt. We'll have some details over on our website, so you can go to lifeontherest.com and check out the article. Let me know what you think about Derek Pratt and his creations. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, leave a link. Uh, leave a comment in the show note. Uh, leave a comment on this video if you want to chat about him. You can also hit us up on our social medias. There'll be links in the in the show in the um, description of this video if you want to see that. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe and share this with your, this channel with a friend who might be interested in watching this. We'd love to have you guys. If you wouldn't mind hitting that like button for me, it really does help me out. And with that said, guys, thank you so much for watching this video, and until next time.